A very good morning, afternoon, evening, and night, everyone. And welcome to the parallel session discussing the gender dimension of the pandemic. My name is Mohammed Nasiri, and I am the Regional Director of UN Women in Asia and the Pacific. The session is being recorded and interpretation in English, French, Spanish, and Italian is available. Uh, COVID pandemic has placed existing inequalities at the forefront. Our communities, families, and societies were already built on the backs of unpaid labor done by women and many girls. And now these same communities are kept functioning because of the increased unpaid care work women and girls have taken on. This so-called free labor is not free. It is what keeps us afloat and what we must recognize that without it and without the resilience and leadership of women, we will go nowhere. We also see the emerging shadow pandemic, domestic violence rates increasing at a staggering rate across all countries. As governments order lockdowns, women become trapped with their own abusers, often without a lifeline and often as a financial stress increased the burden on families. Finally, and while women were still and are and still are at the forefront of the response, they are still largely kept out of the decision-making circles. We have an esteemed list of panelists with us today to speak to the gender dimension of the pandemic, the lessons learned and the implications for the future. We have Ms. Gabriela Ramos, the Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences with UNESCO. We have Ms. Raquel Lagunas, the head of gender team in UNDP. We have Ms. Judith Colem, the executive director of Poverty Reduction Forum Trust in Zimbabwe. We have Ms. Sonia Panieri, the genders policy fellow at the Australian National University. And we have Mr. Laxman Bilbase, the co-director of Global Secretariat of Meningage Alliance. Some of the questions that we will try to answer today are, to what extent have public responses to COVID and recovery efforts been gender sensitive and have ensured women's and girls equal enjoyment of all human rights? What are the lessons for more integrated gender responsive policies during the pandemic and beyond, including for a just transition to sustainable economies? Based on lessons and challenges faced and outcomes observed when women play the leadership role, how can governments promote equal participation and leadership of women and girls in all spheres and levels of public life and decision making during recovery from the pandemic? What data is needed to measure and analyze the impact of the pandemic and girls? What strategy and process can be adapted to engender discrimination and strengthen the mainstreaming of gender consideration in post-pandemic policy formulation? And finally, how can women and girls benefit equitably from social protection schemes? And how can social protection advance gender equality and achievement of SDG 5? We start with Ms. Ramos. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohamed, and, and uh, great to be here with you. Uh, how, how much do I have, uh, Mohamed? For Five this minutes. Week? Five minutes. OK. Well, I, 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 I really welcome the opportunity of joining you in this uh, conversation uh, at UNESCO. In the, I'm, I'm the ADG for Social and Human Sciences. And, the, and, the, and, and what we say is that the, the pandemic uh, has a women face, uh, really. We can just put it as uh, up in front like that. Uh, because as we have confirmed, and this is not only uh, the institutions that are with us today, but in general, we have confirmed that uh, the, the vulnerabilities, the gaps, the, the structural bottlenecks, uh, the, the stereotypes uh, that put women in certain positions uh, left them unprepared um, for the impact of the, of, the, of the pandemic. Why? Because they are overrepresented in the uh, groups uh, living in precarious conditions, 
in poverty, uh, because they were represented in formality, because even those women that are with the formal job usually have careers that uh, meet breaks in several parts of their life uh, curse uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of jobs. And therefore, in terms of social protection, they find themselves with less possibilities to uh, contribute for the, for the um, social protection systems. But more than anything, if you think about comparing this crisis from the 2008 crisis, uh, in the 2008 crisis, it was a financial crisis. It was a mortgage crisis, and then it became a, an economic crisis of large proportions. But this time it is an, a health crisis that became an economic crisis and then is now a social crisis. And in, in, in all these remits, women are really overrepresented. First, because they really fought the pandemic and are fighting the pandemic. In some countries, in my country, in Mexico, 80% of nurses are women. Uh, globally is around 70%. But in general, those are the people that are at the forefront of the fight because they are the ones that are taking care of patients. Given the, the very unskewed distribution of uh, home um, activities and family course, uh, they are the ones that are keeping homeschooling. <laughs> and so at the end, uh, the, the, the school closure put them in this situation. And we're, we're seeing from different uh, academic uh, and uh, analysis that have been reported, even women that are with formal jobs are just quitting the labor market because it's, uh, it's so onerous to be taking care of kids and homeschooling and then maintaining your professional life has become just impossible. And the, and the additional element there is violence against women. And, and we have to say it upfront, uh, if there is a real downside is this question of increased violence. But on top of it, the economic impact, I, I talk about the health and social impacts, but the, the economic impact has felt on women because first their jobs are more precarious and probably are the first to go. Second, because they are overrepresented in the economic sectors that have been hit by the pandemic, uh, all the entertainment, uh, cultural sectors, air, airline and, and air trafficking, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really overrepresented by women, but, but also, as I said, the question of health. So, so the, there had been data showing how much for every job in the US, for example, or for every 10 jobs that were lost to the crisis, eight were uh, earned by women. So I really commend the fact that, that we are raising the visibility of this issue, because if the impact of the crisis had been so unequal and has brought women back uh, ages, and, and of course I, I, I have been talking with our dear from Chile and with you, you and women and the effort is just amazing. And I really commend you for that. Keep, keep the, the, the leadership there and, the, and, and pushing the agenda. But the fact is that this crisis is pushing us back in the SDGs and the achievement of the SDGs. Just starting by the expectancy of living, we're, we're, we're losing three years in, in life expectancy as an average for the world. And I think this is important to put it up front. And I don't think, uh, I think that out of uh, 200 uh, or uh, countries that put together packages uh, to sustain the economic activity and to wave the, the pandemic, there were even less than half that included some gender aspect in it. Uh, and I feel this is something that we need to continue. You have said it already, you and women, you have been saying, we need to have earmark we need to have uh, to budget. We need to have uh, affirmative action in the in the recovery packages, and we need to in interject all these elements that I have mentioned in terms of the of the impact of the of uh, of the of the COVID pandemic. We also we also know that many countries have uh, upscaled their efforts uh, to uh, open services for uh, women that have suffered violence and to keep a lifeline uh, to ensure that they uh, can uh, advance this uh, uh, protecting them, uh, but it's not enough. I would say that it's never enough. Uh, and therefore in UNESCO, what we, what we are advancing, of course, first and foremost, get girls back to school <laughs> because we're very worried about the fact that uh, if there is any loose in terms of uh, learning processes for girls, it will be worse. And for families that fall in precarious situation, it's always easier to choose not to send girls back 
And you know that when you don't send girls back, what happens is that they fell prey to early marriages or, or, or pregnancy or unwanted outcomes that we want for them. But we're also uh, enhancing the agenda against racism and discrimination. And we're looking into the, the issues of uh, violence. But also just now, I was, I was with, the, with the group of members that are negotiating the ethics of artificial intelligence. And we have a very strong chapter because if we have the, 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 the analog world with all these gaps, uh, what is happening is that uh, the digital world is uh, three times more uh, unequal. And uh, with the COVID pandemic, if something uh, progressed was a digital transformation. And for that purpose, we need to ensure that it's inclusive. And we need to ensure that we do not report, uh, we do not reproduce all these gaps and all these biases and, and discrimination in the digital world that we have in the real world. So go for it. I think a strong call for countries to get, if the, if the crisis ha has a women face, the response has also had to have a, a women's face. Thank you so much. And, and you've said it so eloquently, the pandemic has a woman face. And if it does, well, um, and some of the points that you've raised, and I fix uh, I know so long to increase the life expectancy and now it is regretting. Um, from here we do um, move to um, Miss Raquel uh, Lagunas. Um, Raquel is the head of the gender UNDP team. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting UNDP to this very relevant discussion. I would like to start by um, saying loudly that responding one of the questions that you asked, that public responses to coronavirus are not at all responding to women's and girls' needs and rights. I think Gabriela flagged uh, very well how the pandemic just revealed how deep and, per and pervasive are these inequalities in our political, social, economic systems. And at the same time, we need to recognize that women are the shock absorbers of society many times in many crises. So um, I wanted to start by giving you some data. Uh, UNDP with UN Women, uh, at the beginning of coronavirus, we created what uh, is called COVID Global Gender Response Tracker. And we have been screening um, 3,000 policy measures uh, so for more than 200 countries and territories. So we can see that even though women have been more affected by job losses than men, only 13% of all fiscal, labor, and social protection policy measures target women's economic security. So second, despite the care crisis associated to the school closures, lock, lockdowns during the pandemic, only 11% of social protection measures and labor measures targeted unpaid care work. But the most alarming data is that 32 countries, or this represent 15% or, or, or of all those analyzed, have no gender sensitive policy responses at all. So that said, the tracker also show, and I, I always wanted to give some positive and, and some hope, right? Some rays of hope and lessons learned as you were also uh, flagging that um, I wanted to share with all of you. It's encouraging that uh, at least 149 countries have implemented at least one policy measure to address uh, gender-based violence, domestic violence. And the lesson learned here um, is that uh, the attention to GBV needs to be considered and is proven by coronavirus an essential service uh, by government. So second, um, we saw how at least 42 countries were able to implement this holistic uh, response integrating the three aspects that I was mentioning, GBB, social security, uh, sorry, economic security, 
and care, the care crisis. Uh, this is 19% of the countries. And, and third, I think there is another lesson that I would like to share here that is positive. I think the care economy, uh, and this was flagged also and discussed with UN Women, the care economy has entered in the development narrative and it's here to stay. This is very positive, uh, even though the feminist academics you know, have been flagging the need to in integrate this kind of non-paid work, uh, I think we cannot ignore anymore the care economy as the foundation of the global economy. So we all need to join forces to push, to make more concrete commitments on that and help governments here. And, and fourth, I wanted to share with you that UNDP, we, we think that there are some policy measures that it may look like a short term ones, but it's opening uh, for potential driving of long lasting change or to change the development trajectory of countries. I'm going to share one in particular that is an amazing example from Cape Verde. What they did is as, as part of the national COVID response, economic recovery, the Ministry of Finance launched a program to formalize in the informal economic activities. And this program is going to run uh, 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 up to, to 2023. So this is adopt and is adopting a gender perspective, as we know that women are very much in the informal economy. So there are also good, uh, good, um, good news and, and good uh, ev evolves right from countries. And, and to the question, and please remind me the time, the, to the question about uh, women's leadership, women's making decisions, we can also affirm that women are mostly absent. I will, I'll give you the example of coronavirus decision-making uh, task forces. Uh, we were tracking with UN Women and the University of Pittsburgh, also how women are engaged here. And let me give you some numbers. Uh, we analyzed 225 task force in 137 countries. And women make up only 24% of the of the coronavirus of, 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 of the task force members. So the more, more concern is that in 12% of the task force, there are not one single woman. So let's uh, go to something that uh, the Secretary General said, male dominated decision makers will lead to male dominated policies. So if we go to some solutions, some proposals, I think is 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 part of the general, secretary general agenda, the, the promotion, the push of, for quotas across public bodies and temporary special measures. That UNDP is 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 very much not only joining. We have been implementing this in different countries, but equally important the this review of discriminatory laws, review of constitutions, and having uh, national plans, gender equality national plans, budgets. But even, even more crucial to include in public policies the component of discriminatory social gender norms. And again, coming from UNDP Gender Norms Index, we last year launched it and, and we discovered that over 40% of, of, of feel of the population feel that men make better business uh, than, than women. Um, and 28% think that is justified for a man to beat a wife. So I think I am closing here my time. Uh, I have maybe for the Q&A some proposals and some solutions in the short term, like the temporary basic income. We recently launched a policy brief to promote that. And in the long term, I think as we are opening now these conversations, right? How to rethink our economic system, capitalism, and how to rethink the social contract. I will stop here and thank you so much again. Thank you so much, Raquel. Um, indeed, the, the women are the shock absorbers of, of the pandemic. You've said it very eloquently. And, and while many member states now are working on putting in, in place um, policies and frameworks to address gender-based violence, uh, the care economy is now being talked about uh, more than ever before, but as you've said, um, most of the stimulus packages are still gender blind. Uh, most of uh, the economic and social policies are still gender blind in, in the countries that you've done the research in. We move now to uh, Ms. Judith 
uh, Colin, uh, Judith, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mohammed, and thank you for having me. I do really agree with colleagues that have already spoken about how the pandemic has um, a women's face. And I would want to acknowledge that we saw many governments coming up with stimulus packages to respond, but I think the challenge has been the failure to put on a gender lens in instituting uh, those packages. And um, I can only speak about Zimbabwe where I am and what we, what we saw uh, happening. The pandemic came onto an economy that was highly informalized in the majority of those players um, were women. So when I'm talking about the failure to put on a gender lens, like for example, um, when the lockdowns happened and the informal sector uh, was affected deeply and by extension, women affected deeply. We saw business moving to e-commerce Yet realistically, on a day-to-day -day basis, those women who had been in the informal sector neither had the capacity nor skill to migrate to this new norm of working. So maybe uh, in, in comparison to their um, male counterparts, even in the informal sector, who were able to somehow continue doing their business online, the women were hardly, were, were highly disadvantaged in that regard. Some did not even own even a laptop to, to do the business. So already you find that the lockdown um, had a disproportionate um, impact on women. Most countries did uh, report um, high rates of gender-based violence. And it came as a surprise, but we have a saying, I don't know we, whether we all do, we have a saying that says a hungry man is an angry man. And if we knew it, I'm asking, how did we use that to now say, this man is going to be even angrier if he's not going to work, if he has no source of income, and if he's closely together with, he, with his family or for, on time on end, how did we fail to use that to then inform the kind, even of the rescue packages that we're coming uh, up with? So for me, there was a, that's the way we see the gender blindness that I'm saying lacking in terms of the responses uh, that, that we saw. So even when those gender-based violence were coming up, we know most courts were closed because everybody was on lockdown. In my country, I didn't see any um, concerted effort even to come up with toll-free numbers where the women who are now victims of gender-based violence can access and get recourse. So there was no response uh, in that regard. And we also, because uh, now even the parliaments were not working, so the oversight role of parla parliamentarians was not coming. So for a country like Zimbabwe, where even uh, it received um, significant uh, contributions in terms of contributing towards uh, COVID-19, but because there was no oversight, the, the situation actually amplified the impact of corruption. So we had what we call, what we called the, the the COVID gates, where even the minister of of of, um, of health ended up being fired because he had mismanaged um, resources, resources which in a way would have helped women, because we all acknowledge that even the health sector is highly uh, comprising of female workers who would have needed more uh, PPEs to, to protect them, so they were also impacted in that regard. And when we come to, 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 to the issue about lessons, we COVID-19 has just made us realize and we've amplified that exclusion is actually expensive. For a long time, like I'm with, an, a, with a civil society organization and many others, we had been advocating for functional health systems, but not, they were being ignored because that do have resources, they could go and get um, their services even abroad. So we found, we found that because exclusion is expensive, there is then need, even as we plan to build forward, to have a bottom-up approach that puts women at the center 
of the issues that we are going to put in place in terms of building back so that, and also uh, the importance of building partnerships because work was now virtual. In Zimbabwe, we saw a lot of effort, especially with civil society, collaborating with artists to bring the message because we couldn't go physically to meet with them. So I think moving forward, the need for more concerted effort for collaboration, for building an ecosystem of partnerships so that we can amplify what we can do. But in doing so, having women right at the center of, of what, 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 will be, what will be happening. And I also think that um, it, it is important that even as we move forward, we have a combination of programs and actions that ensure that women have access to secure livelihoods so that they are able to even have maximum uh, revenue from what they are doing because the issue of the unpaid care work that we saw that is actually being amplified by the, by the pandemic. So it is important that when women have um, secure livelihoods, it also makes them less vulnerable. So it is important for us moving forward uh, to do that. And I also believe that we need data that speaks to the issues of women. But women are not a homogeneous group. So we need um, the deeper analytical studies that really show the impact of the pandemic on women and girls, and that illustrate the multiple intersecting um, forms of the discrimination that, that they have. But in doing so, we don't, need, we don't have to lump women as one homogeneous group. There has to be intention to say there are women who are living with HIV and AIDS. There are women who are living, women and girls who are living with disabilities. There are women who are migrants. So there has to be an intention so that our measures of intervention really speak to the needs of the people. The other thing maybe I could mention in Zimbabwe, the rescue packages, when government put up a package to say, we are going to help women uh, farmers in the rural areas. Nobody asked to say, and this, they are, this package was being received through the mobile phone, but there are even patriarchal norms where the handset belongs to the, to the husband. But we did not think through, say how will the woman access the funds if the, if the husband has the handset. So really it is important to put, for me, I think the bottom line is to deliberately put on a gender lens as we move forward. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you so much, Judith. Um, it is reassuring that uh, all the speakers are reinforcing each other with, with the main um, issues and challenges that uh, women are facing in the pandemic and how can we move forward. You've added a few dimensions though here, uh, Judith. Uh, one is the COVID related corruption, uh, which is an, a dimension that we really need to look into. Um, the issue of collaboration, it's very naive of us to assume that any single sector can do it on their own. We really need to work all together and to have women in the center, uh, but also the realization that women are not a homogenous group. So we really also need to look into differentiated interventions to suit the, the different uh, categories um, and, and different uh, um, needs of the different women. With this, we move to um, Sonia Palmieri. Sonia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, I want to start by echoing the sentiments already made that the effects of the crisis have not been the same for all. But the analysis on which so many decisions have been made hasn't taken into account that differentiation. My area of specialty is in gender sensitive parliament. So I want to talk today about the way in which parliaments have or have not responded gender sensitively to the pandemic. Um, I, um, of course, would argue that parliamentary democracy is essential in a time of crisis. I go further 
and say that parliamentary democracy that is gender sensitive is even more essential in a time of crisis because as many people have already said this uh, today, it's those societal gender norms and gender inequality that continue to differentiate men and women's experiences of COVID and its aftermath. And this, as I say, has been borne out in evidence produced by different organisations with different mandates across the world systematically, and yet it hasn't been heard. The, the reason that governments, for example, have not heeded that advice might range from political resistance to gender equality or an inability to know how to respond gender sensitively. Um, there are, of course, many in between there. Well, on the question of how they might have responded gender sensitively, I will say that UN Women played a critical role. Early on in the pandemic, it called on experts, including myself, to create a primer uh, for parliaments to respond more gender sensitively to the pandemic. And uh, I worked in collaboration with another expert, Professor Sarah Childs from um, the UK. And on the basis of our experience of having done research on gender sensitive parliaments, in her case, diversity sensitive parliaments, um, we suggested that a parliamentary response to, gen to COVID that was gender sensitive would see stronger representation of women. It would see the raising of voices of women as both constituents and representatives. It would solicit the experiences and the needs of diverse groups of women through perhaps virtual town halls, online surveys, digital messaging. It would target gender experts and marginalized groups, but also go beyond the known suspects and go to the un unusual suspects. In terms of legislation, it would question the effectiveness, the efficiency, the relevance, and the impact of COVID measures. It would identify and allocate more resources to those groups that are likely to be differentially affected. It would consider its legislative program and think about what it might not be able to spend time on because of, it, of the need to address the COVID pandemic. It would use, in terms of scrutiny, gender mainstreaming tools. It would look at impact assessment reviews. It would identify corrective measures and say, well, what would work instead? It would establish specialized committees, dedicated inquiries, and it would allocate resources to those mechanisms. But it would also monitor the participation of women in the debates in parliament. And it would make sure that they were present. Um, it would review the procedural rules to ensure that those voices were there and that women could make their voices heard. To what extent did that happen? Well, not as we've heard from both Raquel and Judith, I think the, the common response of parliaments was to shut down. The IPU uh, conducted a survey early on and asked parliaments to tell them on a voluntary basis uh, what they had been doing. Very few responded that they were um, that, that the measures they were taking would, would be classified as gender sensitive. We saw very few examples of MPs and parliaments acting for women. We saw mostly women parliamentarians raising the voices of women in the constituency. We saw very little um, legislation that we would call gender targeted or gender mainstream. We did see some evidence of oversight that acknowledged the dimension of gender-based violence um, that would be exacerbated. And over time, we saw new measures that kind of tried to merge remote and face-to-face -face deliberation. So what we call the hybrid measures. So those became a little bit more common and there is a little bit of evidence around that now too. But what does that mean really? I think firstly, it means that the responsibility for gender sensitive measures continues to be placed on women parliamentarians. If, as has been said, they are only there as one in five, one in four members of parliament, then that is not sufficient. 
It also suggests that in a time of crisis, gender equality is not the criteria by which we are looking at the way in which parliament works. It is not the criteria, it's not the standard, it's not the culture that is in existence. We know that flexible arrangements are hard. We know that in developing legislation, there's, uh, there has been a hierarchy of credible expertise and gender experts haven't been seen as, as critical and as credible as health experts. And I will say that it is clearly obvious that it is easier to implement gender sensitive responses where the mechanisms and the infrastructure is already there in the parliament. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Sonia. Sonia, are you in Australia at the, at the moment? It's 2.30 in the morning. Well, uh, our hats off to you and, and thank you for being with us here today. You brought another dimension to the discussion because most of the discussions that we have, uh, we, we always talk about the executive branch of government, uh, but we, we seldom talk about the legislative one. Um, uh, and, and as you rightly said, uh, once we have that infrastructure available at the parliament level, uh, implementing gender sensitive policies on the ground uh, and taking the, the gender uh, seriously in um, responding to the crisis will, will be uh, taken more seriously by the executive branch. Uh, with that and with no further ado, um, the floor is yours to uh, you, Laxman. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you, everyone. And thank you for the for inviting me to join this amazing panel. And in the quest of not being too much repetitive, uh, and a lot of things have already come up, but I would like to contribute a little more on looking at the overall response uh, towards the COVID situation and looking at the whole language on that's you know got started even from the very beginning, naming it as a war against the against the, the virus which gave the connotation that it was a war in a specific and hence gave very militaristic and masculine face to responding to the virus, which, which did lead to some of the outcomes that we are referring now at the moment. And I think in, from that sense, from the get-go, I believe that we from the civil society side have been always telling that the response is not gender sensitive. Uh, and again, some of, within the feminist circle, what we have also advocating for is that it's not only enough to look at being gender sensitive and, and clapping around it, whereas the effort and quest is to be more gender transformative. Uh, as was highlighted before, the root causes of the facts that are coming around is uh, around the COVID situation it has to do with the historical patriarchal systems and setups that are there which is not there to cater to the people who are at the margins of the margin. And we've seen that also in the way governments responded in those situations, whereby they even used up to the level where the measures taken were very exclusionary, especially looking at the issues around LGBTIQ rights, uh, the women human rights defenders, we see that in advocacy spaces. You look at the CSW conversation the, on the agreed conclusion, you look at the Human Rights Council resolution from conversation, the language and attacking on the feminist articulation of transformative agenda and looking at transforming the existing system, which has really clearly said and ensured that the COVID has really clearly shown us that the existing systems do not really work and function to cater to uh, have the human centered approach. So that's something I really wanted to also bring, bring forward but also to highlight some of the works that the feminist groups have been doing after that. And, uh, uh, and there is a coalition that really came immediately after the CSW 64 was uh, you know, cut off to be more online. Over 400 feminist advocates from 74 countries came together uh, as a coalition called Feminist Response to COVID, which who put out uh, key principles that needs to be adhered by every institutions, including the governments, in their response. And I would urge everyone to go and have a look on the feministcovidresponse.com, which is the website where all the principles, the different tools that we have been producing uh, are outlined there. 
but also addition point that I really wanted to bring here is about how men and boys have been responding. Yeah, we have been talking about impacts on women's life, on women, but also uh, look at how men in general have been responding in, in the kind of time of crisis. And, uh, you know, Judith and uh, uh, Raquel brought up the issue of how men are emotionally uh, hard because of the kind of gender stereotypical performance and rules they were not able to follow and hence that getting translated into violence. But actually, I'll further boiling it down to say that it is actually the male patriarchal privilege and power and sense of entitlement that is under play on why that is happening. And even if you look at the vaccines and access to vaccines, there is a huge discrepancy in relation to women's access to vaccine and the norms uh, setting up around that even, if you even boil down to the family and interpersonal level, is that generally men tend to be privileged or sort of preferred to get vaccines the first. So I think we need to connect the knots all the way down to individual family level, to the, to the community level, to the state level, to the international level. We have to make those connections and see that the existing this system is not simply working and we have to look at more gender transformative responses to COVID situation and make sure that we are building on to what the women's groups are outlined as part of the principles. The principles that the, the response needs to be very, very intersectional in its operational uh, from the very beginning and from the planning to the implementation and the evaluation and monitoring of it. Uh, the irony though has been, even though a feminist movement has been had put out these principles, government are not listening to it. Government are not even paying attention, let alone, you know, there has been some response to UN women and UN agencies call, but for the civil society who have been at the forefront of, you know, providing services to women in the ground, as you did also mention, uh, the voice of what women want is not incorporating and reaching to the table of decision makers. Uh, also, one thing that we also keep forgetting is it's on, not only about inclusion of women in these spaces, but centering women's voices and leadership role in those spaces. That means reconsidering the way these spaces have been created so that women can lead and play a meaningful influential role in the way decisions are made. So it's not only about plugging women in, if I may give that word for now, but it's around listening to and realigning everything based on what women and girls are asking for and asking for that kind of services. And, and also the data part is extremely important. Unfortunately, the data mentality has been so that we need to justify that violence against women is happening. Rather, it should be the other way to say that where are the gaps, the data that needs to be in place is to show where are the gaps that is not meeting up to uh, accepting the equality, dignity, and human rights of women and girls, and also people who identify differently, uh, meaning LGBTIQ population. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Laxman. And as you rightly said, while we need to immediately look into how are we going to incorporate women with intentionality in the response of COVID? How are we going to look into engendered uh, uh, stimulus packages? How are we going to look into addressing the immediate uh, uh, increase in violence against women and all other genders due to the pandemic? We also need to look uh, and work on the medium and longer term to address patriarchy. And that will not happen without addressing norm change that is going to take time. Um, thank you again very much for, for all these interventions. Uh, while um, we, we were having these um, um, interventions from you, there were some questions coming from the floor. Um, I start with a few questions from Dr. Uh, Shashi Singh uh, from the Consortium of Women Entrepreneurs of India. The first um, is actually to all panelists, and, and it goes uh, as follows. Um, the number of women in leadership positions in the public sector um, are low throughout the world. What is the long-term impact of education disruptions on the already small pool of women 
that can be drawn upon, particularly in fragile and low income countries. So um, shall we um, give it a try to attempt to answer this question maybe first, uh, and then I move to the other questions. Any uh, any take from the panelists? Well, I I I, I cannot uh, uh, I I have to say something because we are UNESCO and it's uh, about the location. Um, I I have Absolutely. to say that uh, it it's more complex than that. I think that the way it is presented is as if because there are school disruption that probably are going to affect more girls, which we agree. And that's why we are really putting a lot of emphasis on, on uh, getting, getting all kids back to school, uh, uh, trying to uh, support those that were less able to cope with the situation. Uh, and, and there again, because uh, the vulnerabilities and the precariousness girls are always uh, more affected. But, but that's not the point in terms of, uh, of uh, how much this will affect the representation of women at the top. Because what we have seen at the, in the last decades is that uh, school enrollment for girls have grown in almost all countries. And many countries, even uh, very low income countries have achieved universal primary education for girls and, and, the, and the enrollment continues to grow up. We also know that now in, uh, in advanced economies uh, and, and even I would say in India because India was uh, mentioned uh, or is the source of the question, uh, you have more women uh, getting into university degrees. 51% uh, uh, of graduates uh, in, in many countries or 55% uh, of university degrees or tertiary education are women. But that didn't result in higher representation at the top. Uh, why? Because, because of, of, of the way we run the business at the top, <laughs> because the lack of affirmative action because uh, even when you have girls uh, getting into the school, there is always this stereotyping that might bring them to go for um, social or, or, or humanities or nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the reality is that uh, disciplines that are less uh, well paid and less connected to this kind of, uh, of world. I think that as usual, you need to have a very holistic agenda. First, of course, continue with the education, but then you need to have the, 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 the policies and the best practices and the instruments that we know work to increase representation at the top. And I have to say, and I think it was Raquel or, or Sonia who mentioned it, nothing worked like, better than quotas. And, and the countries that have really achieved uh, this representation uh, are countries that have gone through quotas. I, I can tell you that I, when I was at the OECD, I worked with my own country, uh, Mexico, to establish a quota in, in the Congress. And, and now we have uh, parity. Uh, of course, when we put it there, it was uh, highly criticized uh, because we were going to have a lot of incompetent women I was thinking we have a lot of incompetent men without quotas, but uh, that besides, the fact is that the reality is that this is the only way because it's the only real uh, strong measure to break all these stereotypes and to break the fact that it's very difficult to make it at the top because of all the reasons we have mentioned in terms of the restribution of responsibilities. And so it's, it's, it's both ways, but I agree. Let's take care of girls first in the school and then continue with the with the with the affirmative actions that we need to to balance uh, the, the the distribution of uh, of positions at the top thank you so much and uh, you're absolutely right i believe such a complex problem as gender inequality uh, cannot be tackled by simple or siloed solutions and as you rightly said we need a comprehensive holistic system to address the issue so education alone is not going to um, help. It is absolutely important, but not alone. Um, and I, I have to profusely apologize. The question uh, was actually from uh, Valentina Resta. Uh, the question from uh, Dr. Shashi is, um, in India, women do not have access to infrastructure in terms of digitization and so are discriminated and excluded in the entire development process as all deliveries are now online, including banking and education. How can we address that? 
again, the question is all to all panelists. So um, please uh, come in. Uh, hi, Mohammed. Can I come in? Absolutely. I actually want to go back to the first question from Valentina on on education, on having women um, in decision making positions in relation to education. And the way I wanted to address it is firstly to agree with what Gabriela has talked about, the holistic agenda. Because what we saw with, um, with the pandemic and the closure of schools and learning going online, for me, even if in my country we had achieved 50-50 representation of women in decision making, when education went online, that alone would not help us. In most households, that burden fell on women, on women who had no skill, with or less skill in comparison to men in terms of using internet-based um, appliances. So by having women in charge of the education of the children, it, it, it was it's already a challenge. But if we had had a, an inclusive development agenda that ensured that women were capacity all across all levels, they would have taken this um, uh, responsibility um, more fairly and more productively. So I'm just advocating for a holistic approach and inclusive development. Um, yes, we need women in making positions, but COVID has told us that it's, it's not enough. We need just to go broader than that. I just wanted to add that dimension. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another um, question uh, from Valentina to uh, both you, Sonia, and, uh, and Judith. Um, you both mentioned parliaments and the role together with uh, other oversight institutions uh, to promote gender responsive legislation and measures. A good example, women activists uh, reacted um, to the increase of gender-based violence cases by sensitizing parliamentary groups and by proposing uh, changes to the criminal code in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, do you have other uh, positive uh, examples from around the world that you can bring? Of, um, of specific legislative changes? Correct. Um, I don't. Uh, I think, I mean, I, I think the issue is the preparedness of parliaments to be able to respond uh, to the crisis. Uh, and I think what we found was that there was no preparedness. So um, I think really a really good analogy is the work that is done in, across the world on disaster ready preparedness for all kinds of other crises, parliaments haven't had that preparedness to respond to a pandemic in this way, considering the effects um, that are of course so well, um, so well evidenced. I, I also just wanted to touch on the question of education. I think what, what is really important is the way in which we have seen leadership played out in the pandemic as a masculine kind of, we must be decisive in our decision making, we must be timely, we must act um, without it necessarily being deliberative. And I think obviously the lack of women in the spotlight has also exacerbated, I think, what will be the effect on continuation of women in leadership. If we continue to see that in this time of crisis, leadership has been in the hands of men and that that has been what has gotten us through, positively or negatively, that I think has a detrimental effect on the continued in inclusion and I think promotion of women in, in leadership. I, I also think sometimes it has been easy to look at the few women leaders and their very positive responses and say, well, women have been better. There has been some analysis that the women who have been leaders 
of countries, for example, New Zealand, my neighbor, um, yes, Jacinda Ardern has been a very effective leader, but she also has been an effective leader in a country that has good democratic systems, um, that was able to respond. It was also an island. It had lots of other things going for it. So I think we also need to be careful about the way in which we conceptualize leadership in this time. Thank you so much. Um, a question from uh, Christiana Carletti um, of Italy. Uh, we've experienced in last year's relevant and innovative public-private partnerships aimed at pursuing an effective gender equality in all countries worldwide. They have targeted and channeled their efforts towards the health, economic, social crisis faced by women and girls in 2020. How do you think these new public-private partnerships could be preserved and reinforced beyond the pandemic also to re-enhance public trust along SDG 16 core targets under gender lens. Um, again, it's a question to uh, all the panelists. So maybe I can jump here. Absolutely. I think there are good examples uh, that, that can show how during the pandemic, the private sector established alliances with the public and, and even beyond the public also with different actors and stakeholders. I was reading right now, for instance, uh, in Peru and linked to the question on GBV, on, on domestic violence. Uh, uh, UNDP, for instance, uh, supported the government and the government partnered with uh, 52 private, private sector companies uh, to develop and launch a campaign uh, in Spanish is, well, let's say in English, you are not alone uh, in the context of COVID to disseminate very broadly and fast information on services in supermarkets, pharmacies, in different, in different spaces. So this is a very small example, but if, if we go, for instance, to, to how do you, do we, or governments finance SDGs that uh, or can be um, the reduction of poverty or education or water, no? Um, uh, we, we definitely have been seeing how they can join in the financing uh, by developing innovative tools like the gender lens investment or gender equity bonds. No, there are, now a kind of range of new and emerging uh, ways of, of joining and making these connections. So I think the private sector has a fundamental fundamental role here. Um, and I, and I, I think, I think uh, it's important that um, we develop at least the UN uh, standards and, and we can also accompany these processes uh, to ensure that the normative kind of no the human rights framework and the normative um, the normative uh, kind of no uh, a, a scenario that is very important is, is also something on on the agenda. So I think it is, it is a very timely question and and let's all together try to move the gender equality agenda on this direction. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Um, another question from Magda Maro. Um, thank you for your presentations. Is there any way the international organizations are looking at the impact of COVID on women in conflict zones, such as the Tigray in Ethiopia? Um, maybe I can uh, just start uh, wearing the UN Women hat and pass to you, uh, Raquel. Um, in, in the Asia Pacific region, we, we did roll out a survey right after the, the breakout one week later, and it reached 27 million people in the region. And this has uh, helped us um, look into the differentiated needs. Um, as Judith was saying earlier, um, not all women are homogenous, and women in conflict and humanitarian uh, settings are extremely vulnerable and they are um, further impacted by, by the pandemic. And 
um, as UN Women, we've worked on uh, engendering the humanitarian response uh, to COVID in these countries through the mechanisms that we have as the United Nations, but also worked in providing technical um, advice uh, to, to the member states who are in these uh, humanitarian settings. And I um, include um, the humanitarian the uh, countries that are hit by natural disasters, because during the course of 2020, many of the Pacific islands have been hit mm -hmm. by cyclones. Uh, Bangladesh has been hit by a cyclone that comes once in a generation, and, and we've been working on that. But allow me also to pass to Raquel to um, add on that. So I, I, I think that um... With the, with the global tracker, frankly speaking, what we measured was the intention, right? The measures, not the impact of the measures. So if we want to really to track and uh, uh, the data that we need to analyze, to connect, the, you need a baseline on where are where were, no? In the different aspects, a baseline, where are we? Um, in terms of gender equality in the different countries, we have a lot of indicators previous to coronavirus that give us the clues. So it's just continuing gathering up this data and connecting the measures with some changes, some improvements. And, and it's not easy what I'm saying because you need to have, no, you need to have the service as Mohammed was mentioning. You need to, to have the, the, from the household level to the more kind of meta metadata um so the next steps i think in every single country there is a effort at least for from the u.n system side and i have no questions that also governments their own capacities they are tracking uh no different aspects of the impact of the coronavirus uh, of the pandemic so so in media in the medium of this kind of no of complex process and situation that we have and, and we need to recognize that when we respond to crisis and i was very touched but uh, but uh, by by um, by one of the panelists that i'm missing now sonia by sonia so we, we need to recognize that when we respond to crisis including governments and, and human beings let's say that no we tend to go to the comfort zone so and the comfort zone I think it's the underline, as Laxman also, uh, you know, and we all were saying here. So the point to really measure with more rigor the impact, I hope we can do it uh, in the next months, but it may come a little bit later. That's what I suspect once the things are settling down. And keep in mind that in different countries, they are really facing a still very challenging situation, very challenging. So. It's a combination, no? The answer is not just one answer, but that definitely we should keep tracking. We should keep monitoring because otherwise there is no way to, to, to see if we are, if the governments and all the community, no, that is trying to, uh, to respond to the crisis are really uh, reaching everybody, uh, reaching the left behind and even the left out. That is, it's more, it's more difficult to capture, even to capture. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I will stop here because the, the issue of data is really, I see Laxman maybe wanted to complement. Yeah, no, thank you, Rachel. No, I think, yeah, that's, you know, brilliant questions in relation to, you know, education, but also I wanted to touch on the private-public partnership idea. And I think, again, to come back to what is the essence that we need to put in place as a condition for this partnership, probably also, we understand there is a good intention behind our colleagues coming forward. But I think we have to also understand the how capitalist model of, you know, the, 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 from the private sector, if they are coming in from a very capitalist ideology and perspective and profit making perspective, there is a huge problem on within that itself in the partnership because the feminist ideology is to address and dismantle the capitalist thinking and modality of work and then keep the humanity at the center and work on that. So I think 
we, we have to also keep that in mind and bring into. But also in terms of the impact, we have seen that also, you know, the cyclone that Muhammad you are referring to in Bangladesh during when the COVID started. And it really showcased on how the women and girls are even marginalized further by the even the response. We have seen that in Rohingya population as well, the, the refugee camps in Bangladesh. But also, uh, but also the inter some of the international organizations like IRC, um, uh, you, you know, UNSCR have been some systems in place. And there is an interagency working group that also sort of monitors uh, the situation of women and girls in those uh, conflict zones, but also looking at the conflict and the response and how the priorities of the population at the margins of the margins are still sidelined because Again, the, the response usually in those situations is highly masculine, meaning you go there, you act and run, right? There is no consultative, there is no thinking of what could be, and that has been the challenge for all the humanitarian responses. Previously with my own work with Save the Children when I was working on the humanitarian side, I always, as the gender I used to struggle to integrate gender lens and say that you need to talk with people what they really need rather than assuming and going there uh, and running based on your own assumption whereas the, the need could be very, very different. And I think that applies to any other marginalized population. And I see Dr. Badr's question there, and also coming from South Asian context, and I'm originally from Nepal as well. Uh, but the systems uh, are, are not really set up to be inclusive. That, that's the benchmark. And even in the quest of the framework of leaving no one behind, we need to really, as you know, Rafi brought that up, uh, it, we need to really understand who, who is it that we are talking about when we say no one, who is this no one? And if we don't question this, some, some assumptions in these frameworks we come with, we really end up again further marginalizing the population that is at the margins of the margin. And that being again coming out to indigenous marginalized population, what we have seen in the COVID situation, the, peop the, the LGBTIQ population has also been the hardest in the hit. They are not able to get services in any of the sector because the response has been so gender binary. It, it is not take, 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 take a, sort of taking care of the needs that LGBTIQ populations would have and would require in these processes. And hence sort of challenging some of the SDG uh, indicators, including that in SDG 16 in specific, but also around the SDG five um, in general also relating to the paid and unpaid care working burden around it. So yeah, it's, sorry, I, I don't know if it's making sense, but it's it's complex. <laughs> Very much so. Um, I, I know that Ms. Ramos has another uh, pressing meeting now. So maybe uh, if I pass the floor to you for some concluding remarks from, from your good self, and then we go back to the questions. To you, Ms. Ramos. Thank you so much, and I, I'm very sorry to leave you, Mohamed, and, and, and all of the fantastic speakers, Raquel, uh, Sonia, Laxman, I, I've been learning from you. Uh, the fact is that uh, I, I guess that the main message would be that um, we are in the face of hopefully uh, getting out of the crisis slowly, but uh, with the vaccination process, we hopefully will be able to um, uh, advanced uh, in the in the worst part of the crisis, and and of course our call should be to have uh, recovery packages that that have this very strong gender lens, but they should this should also be accompanied by all the homework that we left pending, and the homework is legislate equality, the homework is finance equality. The homework is uh, having policies and instruments to uh, push for equality. I completely agree with uh, Laxman. It's, it's about having granular information, mm -hmm. not to get uh, policies informed by uh, very general indicators that doesn't really tell us the, how people are thriving or not, and particularly women. And then, of course, uh, what is uh, my real concern, and, and in UNESCO, I'm in, in charge of the ethics of science and the ethics of artificial intelligence. We are reproducing a world in the digital uh, uh, space uh, that is three times more unequal. And if women are underrepresented in, in some of the professions that, uh, that uh, we know are better paid, 
uh, in the digital space and as uh, producers or users, uh, they're really lagging behind. So this goes back to one of the questions, infrastructure again, if there are 300 less million women worldwide connected to a smartphone, well, let's just focus on that. <laughs> I think this is very straightforward. So thank you so much. And I, I wish you um, a, a fruitful ending of the panel. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for your valuable contributions with us today. Um, wonderful to have you aboard. Okay. Um, I, I do uh, would like to remind all the uh, participants today um, for those who have questions, instead of uh, taking the floor, please leave the questions in the question and answer section of, of, the, uh, of the screen and, and we will read them out loud and have the panelists uh, try to, to address them. Um, uh, Laxman, you've uh, actually attempted to um, start answering one of the important questions that came from the floor uh, from Takba Durtamang on, on uh, how uh, indigen indigenous and marginalized women, and I would add uh, other people as well, all, all genders, have no meaningful participation in the decision making and development process. Um, and, and how can uh, we um, achieve gender equality at all sectors if their voices are, are not heard? So um, would you like to elaborate a bit more on that, Laxman? Uh, other, other friends uh, today, would, would, would you like to come in? Yeah, very quickly, I think, on, on giving on to that question and on the answer the part of it. Um, also, we need to understand that I think it, it, it's also not only because of COVID we experienced the lack of participation of indigenous and marginalized women and population in general. It is it has been a gradual process through which this population has structurally been marginalized, and hence their representation lacks at the moment in these tables as well. But also, you know, you bring it an important point on on the international funding resources. Uh, which is, I think, an important point to consider is that the, the donors uh, also needs to be mindful of on how they are prioritizing the, or the, how they are identifying the priorities when they allocate uh, resources for the response on COVID. And the response also needs to be taken into consideration the, the, the need of the population that, that they are working with. And that also we can't continue working and assuming that population are homogeneous. It's very, very, very uh, you know, diverse in terms of population, but also you know, achieving gender uh, parity in all sector also requires, as it has been already mentioned, looking at it from a multi-sectoral approach. And we, we can't just look at uh, an integration of gender transformative lens uh, building on and calling this out a little more from being gender sensitive to gender transform the them so that these systems can be transformed on in itself. So connecting up, and also that is something that also another question for me is because the way the historical trajectory of how certain populations, especially and disproportionately women and girls have been marginalized is resulting into what we are seeing in COVID. The, again, the gap that will COVID will create will have even longer ramification when it comes to parity, equality, and justice and human rights for the population who are at the margins of the margin. So again, we need to look at cross-sectoral, and this is the time where we can think about being more transformative and start looking at, not only looking at building back better, but building forward. I guess the back, the back was not good enough. We need to, we have learned that, and going back is not an option. Let's think forward to transform the system and see how we can reestablish system, maybe at parliament level or policy level or community level or family level, work with everyone to restructure the systems that have been not really proven to be working for human rights and, and dignity and justice. So build forward more equal and more inclusive. Um, a question from Benjamin. Uh, uh, Mensa Kalate. Um, Benjamin um, 
uh, refers to the the gender dimensions report on the pandemic um, and and he says the pandemic has further exacerbated discrimination and increased inequalities and risks of backsliding on gender equality analysis show a widening of the poverty gap between women and men pushing 47 million more women and girls into poverty by the end of the current year this will increase the total number of women and girls living in extreme poverty to 435 million with projections showing that this number will not revert to pre-pandemic levels until 2030. And the question is, on what basis is the, this projection? And secondly, what efforts are being made to revert the projection uh, to reverse the projection of increasing poverty of 47 million of women and girls by 2030 to the pre-pandemic conditions. Again, the question is uh, to any of the panelists to take the floor. So maybe maybe I can answer the, the first question because I um, I think the data that he's putting on the table comes from a research done by UN Women and UNDP and the Pardeep Center for International Futures, projecting trends from um, overall estimates from different institutions. So we were kind of putting together all the numbers, including IMF, um, based on what it was available, but mostly through household level. So this is the main, the main ground and the main tool. And you know that this has limitations, right? Uh, uh like um you know there, there, there is always a um a, a gap um and a number of women that are not included on that so and and of course when we are talking about extreme poverty we are talking about those living with less than 1.9 dollars uh, a day so here frankly the answer to what are we doing not i mean not us what this, no? Governments are doing and also international community and to address the situation. What is coming, for instance, from the global tracker is that the main bulk of, of actions or, or interventions to address the economic insecurity of women are very much linked to cash transfers. So those are kind of short term remedies, right? Uh, and as the, I said, UNDP is proposing a um, temporary basic income, a universal temporary basic income uh, for, for all for all women uh, uh, falling under this category that it will require an investment of the 0 0.07 of the, of, the, of the PIV. So there are many, many remedies, but from our side, what we really think is that we need to go for more structural reforms so, and there are some policies that you know, are more critical than others or that can change more critically the, 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 the challenges of capitalism as, and, and, and the economic, uh, predominant economic system, but it's a combination. For instance, universal social protection can make a huge difference. Uh, we need new, new fiscal policies. We need to, ta to, to talk about the, the debt, right, of countries. So all of this kind of package is there on, uh, and, and we need to, to discuss it and we need to, to go for a different approach to, to, you know, to make it also green because how can we discuss coronavirus without bringing the implications of the damage that you know, we, are, we are doing to our planets and our, the ecosystem. So there is, is, is a systemic answer there no? and it cannot be just the answer coming from one country it needs to be a kind of global, I don't know, somehow global agreements that we need to make things different. And, and definitely in my view, to respond to the economic kind of uh, increase of poverty in women cross through the fact that women need to be at the decision making level. So, so we need to put uh, all, all, everything on, on, on together make it to make a difference so i think we we learned in this coronavirus how for instance inclusive administration public administration is fundamental so how we 
the result of the of the tracking of number of women in coronavirus task force is not surprising because if you go to the number of in public administration for women, you see it's not that we come for for from a previous previous inequality and and but uh, overall I think we need to go for a long term changes rather than of course the short term are so fundamental but the long term ones are even more important. So I will stop here. Thank you. That's a very important question. Thank you uh, so much, um, Raquel. Um, we're we're coming to the end of our session today. It's um, I well, have I'm to say gonna... yes. Sorry, just before you close, I just wonder if I could uh, kind of develop some of the ideas that Raquel was talking about, but also respond to a question I think in the chat that was asking about data. And um, you know, the question was, what kind of data do we need? I think um, actually, I mean, my view is that we have plenty of data, uh, that there has been a lot of evidence produced on which to make more gender sensitive responses. However, I do think that parliamentarians and, and I guess any kind of decision maker does need to have a stronger capacity to question some of the data that they are given in making these analyses. So some of the time, you know, we have governments producing data that's not representative, that's not valid, that doesn't take a long term view, that doesn't ask the same question over, the, over a period of time. So the so we do need to improve capacity within Parliament to do that gender sensitive um, analysis. There are some training tools, of course, that the Canadians have developed and you know, Canada has been at the forefront of looking at gender based analysis plus. So it doesn't just look at men and women, but takes on all of the intersectionalities that we have in the world. Um, and I think we need to be much better at supporting that broader analysis. So sorry, I just wanted to make that point. Thank you so much, Sonia. I was not actually going to close. I, I, um, I, I wanted to go for one final round uh, amongst us all. Um, but I have to, to say that the, that the session has been very refreshing because usually, um, uh, these kind of webinars, uh, you have uh, the panelists speaking for a very long time, and then we don't have any opportunity for an interactive session with the participants, while today it's been really a very interactive one. Um, so maybe we can go back to uh, all of you, uh, maybe for um, putting forward maybe one to three final recommendations on moving forward from here. So we've talked about some of the lessons learned, but how can we move forward from here? As uh, Laxman said, how can we build forward uh, more equal and more inclusive? So maybe we uh, start with you, uh, Judith. Um, uh, th thank you very much. I think I can only echo what colleagues have said. If we are going to move forward in a manner that transforms women's lives, we need to have women being more active. We need to have women at the center. We need to have uh, solutions that come from the bottom. And I think it is important then to deliberately look at the barriers that stop women from being that active. And I like what colleagues have said, including Laxman, in terms of um, listening to what the women want. I think we need to move away, as, as key stakeholders, to move away from this belief where we have disused the term empowerment, that women need to be empowered but to believe that women have the capacity because they know what they want. So they have, they only need to have a conducive environment for them to be able to actively participate and influence the development going forward. So I just think we need to, 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 to genuinely begin to listen and not to make women's participation a tokenism kind of thing. 
we deliberately need to, to, to be more genuine in our engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Raquel. Unmute. You can unmute yourself. I was saying that I was writing and if you don't ask me, I will never stop like, yeah, and this and this and this. So I think, frankly speaking, I think that, and for UNDP is very important that we strengthen the pillars of democracy governance systems in countries. And those are, this is public administration and public institutions. And then we will, we will have solid education, health, um, ministries of finance that can respond and be resilient uh, in this situation of, of no global a global pandemic. Uh, we wanted to see this kind of strong government um, able able to to respond, uh, but also we wanted to learn from it, from instance from lessons from countries with more gender higher kind of rates so gender equality they are more resilient so. This kind of strengthening of the government cannot happen without including gender equality, gender parity. Gender equality is broader than parity, right? We don't talk only about balance. We talk about a, a range of standards that, uh, and for instance, Sonia was describing the ones for parliament, but you can apply those ones to many other instances. And I think we need the, the, the last recommend, the two last recommendations. One is let's be ready let's start preparing how to include care economy in the care in the economy in, in the national accounting system in, in 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 the provision of infrastructure and services and you may think this woman is crazy because we are in a crisis so it's very difficult to 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 live or improve or overcome the crisis without addressing these kind of needs so we we can start preparing that and last i fully fully agree with um with the with the recommendation listening to women strengthening women's organizations they are the gatekeepers the holders the, advo the advocators so it's so fundamental to invest really and uh, now more than ever because they are they are the front lines and responding to the needs where never can reach we where, where we cannot reach so they are there so that's my last recommendation thank you so much civil society. Thank you so much. Uh, Sonia? Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you very much um, to all of the panelists. I've really enjoyed listening to all of you today. Um, for a long time, I um, assumed that institutionalizing gender sensitive responses by having parliamentary committees that looked at gender equality, that had rules of procedure that, that made the work of parliament, look at the gender lens, would be the way to achieve gender equality. And over time, I realized that the resistance that we, that we see more and more to gender equality is, is because of the real threat that it poses to men in power. And so actually, I have come to see the importance of gender equality as a fundamental goal of the work of parliament as more important than institutionalizing certain kinds of mechanisms and processes. Um, and so if we as a society can come to a point where we recognize and value the goal of gender equality and then reorient what we do towards achieving that goal, we will be in a much better place across every sector. I think gender equality needs to be seen not as some sectoral interest to women, but as a fundamental goal that improves societies around the world. I know it sounds very esoteric and ambitious, but I think that has to be the goal. Absolutely. Lexman. Wait, all of that, huh? And what I would definitely add is the importance of partnership moving forward. I think it's not a movement, movement at a time where we can still you know, forget about the small disagreements that we have but everyone who is working on gender equality to come together and actually form a stronger coalition so that we can push back against the pushback that you know, UN Secretary General Gibson talking about. And we have seen that happening. Uh, and I think on 
in relation to moving forward, also the very, again, reiterate the fact that ensure meaningful participation of women rights organization, I mean, feminist women rights organization in COVID-19 decision making processes and structures. Uh, with, uh, you know, one of the things that we heard from the women's rights and women in the ground within the spotlight initiative and I sit at the global reference group there was the allocation of funding by the donors and governments for the core funding because the international development framework did not work and apply and enabled colleagues in the ground to, to be able to respond to the emerging needs those are coming from the ground. And we need to be mindful of how we allocate and provide space for our women's rights organizations who are at the forefront on addressing this issue and, and the agenda of equality and justice, be able to do their work in the best way that needs to be done so that the funding restrictions and by all the donors needs to immediately work around that. Again, reinforcing what Sony has, uh, no, I think Raquel, uh, you talked about safeguarding civil society space. We have seen that happening. We see that now the devastating situation in India, we still see a lot of restrictive space for civil society. Modi government has been asking not to even comment on some of the things, which is inhuman at all. Uh, I, we saw that in Nepal with uh, the, the demonstrations were happening in public, the politicians were only looking at their own profit, whereas the public was going on the street now infecting everyone else in the public in a massive way. And we don't know what is coming next. So I think it's time for everyone who are in this sector to come together and realize we need to come together. The last point is the data manipulation, building on to Sonia what you said. It's not the lack of data, it's the manipulation of data that has been the problem. So I think it's time to challenge the manipulation that our men in power positions have been doing around in different institutions and start building on and work also with those men, like for, from my point of view within Men in Gate, like let's come together to hold these men in power positions to account and for to deliver the, the uh, you know, deliver what they, they, they are supposed to be doing and be sensitive of surveillance system with automatic AI system, automatic intelligence system that is being coming forward and we are now fascinated about, but it is coming with a lot of challenges and restricting even our own movement, our own in emotions with this AI system that governments are thinking about. Uh, just some points of warning, but some points for us to actually build solidarity across wherever we are working together. Thank you so much. And, and this has been most enriching. We need to work on the grassroots level from the bottom up. We need to listen to women at the top. We need to work on structural changes in all parts of government, legislative and executive. And uh, 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 we need to work in partnership and in collaboration for us to move forward, to build forward more inclusive and more equal. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. And um, we look forward to uh, a fruitful and um, very successful uh, rest of, of the conference. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.